This is Charlie Ruggles. This is Edward Arnold. And this is Hugh Douglas saying welcome to Hollywood Soundstage. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, the doors of our Hollywood soundstage swing open for 30 minutes of exciting drama. A most unusual story tonight. One of the greatest stories ever brought to the screen. The gripping and realistic study of what happens to men when they become a mob. Hollywood Soundstage is proud to bring you transcribed 20th Century Fox Studios' magnificent motion picture, The Oxbow Incident, based on the famous novel by Walter Van Tilburg Clark, and starring Edward Arnold, Charlie Ruggles, and the Screen Guild Players. <laughs> I don't suppose many people remember it now. It was back in 1885, you see. A small thing, not much. You might say, just an incident. The town looked almost deserted that day. A few wooden shacks, a blazing sun, one dusty street and nothing moving. Just an old, tired mongrel dog. Until that cowhand came pounding down the road, pulled up his horse in front of Darby's saloon, and yelled, Hey, man! Where's everybody? Where are you, men? The boys came piling out of the bar. And pretty soon, the way they sounded, I could tell that something was wrong. So I left my place, I ran the general store, you see, and went right over to find out. Darby was the one who told me. Standing behind the bar and polishing a glass. Someone get Larry Kincaid last night. Found him laying in a dry wash this morning. Dead? Shot right through the head. Yeah, but who? Kincaid didn't have any enemies. Who'd do a thing like that? Been a lot of cattle stolen this year. You mean rustlers? Maybe. Jeff Farnley's taking it pretty hard. Him and Kincaid were buddies. Yes, I know. Them other boys are kind of hot, too. They find them wrestlers, they might do something about it. A lynching? I wouldn't be surprised. Well, I'd seen things happen like that before. One minute, just a crowd of men, and the next minute, a mob. You know, it's a funny thing about mobs. No one wants to be first, and no one wants to be last. But just let someone start it off, and the madness spreads like a prairie fire. I knew they wouldn't listen to me, so I sent a lad running to get Judge Tyler. And pretty soon he was there, up on the steps, facing the crowd. Believe me, men, I know how it is. My old friend Larry Kincaid, one of the finest and noblest gentlemen. Cut the snuffing, Judge. We got a job to do. All we want is your blessing. Now, finally, of course, you can't flinch from what you believe to be your duty... But this is something that should be left to the law. By the time the law gets ready to act, them rustlers will be over the Rio. One more word out of you, Monty Smith, and I'll have you up for impeding justice. Judge, you can't impede, but don't hardly move. And you, Jenny Greer, a woman, to lend yourself to a thing like this. Ha, ha. That's telling him more! Now listen, listen, men. The sheriff is down at Kincaid's right now. Judge, is that true? It sure is, Davies. He went down this morning. Yeah, you see, men, everything's being attended to legally. Now you just have a long, hard ride for nothing. It'll be dark soon and mighty cold. Now my advice is to come on inside and have a drink and wait till we hear from the sheriff. Uh, What do you say? Drinks on the house. One round on me. Oh, and I'll up that, Darby. I'll make it two. And I'll make it three for everyone but Jenny Greer. <laughs> yeah, we had him laughing. And I was sure we'd won. Only just then we heard another voice. Level, hard, and cold as ice. What's the matter, men? Disbanding? Looks that way, Major Tetley. Brother Davies here just about convinced us. Of what, Mr. Davies? Why, it's useless to follow those men, Major. They could be over the Rio by now. Uh, but they aren't. As it happens, they went east by Bridges Pass. Through the mountains? That's right, finally. 
By way of Oxbow. Yeah, but that's 8,000 feet up. They'd be crazy to go that way. You're not so crazy, Mr. Davis, knowing how crazy it'd look to us. How come you're so sure, Major? Well, one of my riders saw them. He hid in the woods and let them pass. He thought it strange they should be driving cattle up there. Cattle? Any marks? Yes, finally. They carry the B bar H. That's Kincaid's mark. The dirty rats. How many were there? Three of them. Strangers. My rider said he'd never seen them before. Yeah, but Major, why were you so long bringing us this word? My son was out on the range. I knew he'd uh, want to go along. Gerald, is that correct? I'm here, Father. Isn't that all that counts? It counts for me. Finally, you stay off that horse. Now, I'm not asking you finally. I'm telling you. Telling me what, Judge? Now, look, Jeff, you don't have to worry. This business will be taken care of. Yeah, and I know who's going to take care of it. Me. Now, Jeff. Whoever shot Larry Kincaid ain't coming in here for you to fuddle with your lawyer's tricks for six months. Kincaid didn't have six months to decide if he wanted to die. You ready, Tetley? Major Tetley, you mustn't let this be a lynching. Well, it's scarcely what I'd choose, David. You now promise me you'll bring them in for a fair trial. Look here, Tetley, you know what's legal. You can't have a posse without a sheriff. All right, what about me? What about you, mate? I'm a deputy. The sheriff swore me in before he left this morning. Well, in that case, Mr. Mate, suppose you deputize the rest of us. You can't. It's illegal. No deputy can deputize. Uh, what do you think, Major? <laughs> well, that's good enough for me. Me too, Butch. Go ahead, pray. All right. Butch, Mate, you're violating the law. All right, men, raise your right hands. I hereby solemnly swear that I am sworn in as a deputy in the case of the murder of Larry Kincaid. And I'm willing to abide by the decisions of the majority. So help me God. Say I do. I do. I do. All right, men, check your guns and horses. On, we'll leave from here in exactly ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, next party! You coming, Sparks? No, sir, Mr. Smith, I don't guess so. Why not? We ought to have a reverend along. Gonna be some praying to do. Yeah, now, now, lay off him, Smith. Excuse me, Mr. Davis, maybe he's right. No, he's joking you, Sparks. Yeah, I know, but maybe someone ought to go to feels the way I do. Why, sure. Davis can loan you his Bible so as to keep the burial fit and proper. Thank you, sir, but I knows the text without the book. Yeah, you can take my horse from the shed, Sparks. Come along, we'll get him out. Thank you, sir. Sparks. Yes, sir. Can that kid of yours and ride? Sure can, Mr. Davis, just like an Indian. And he's the only one who can go. Where, sir? Where to? Down to Kincaid's to get the sheriff. Father wants you to be riding up with him? Sure. I suppose so. Major Tetley and son, riding out at the head of the pack. Mm, you don't like this thing, do you? How can you like it? Going out to hunt men like coyotes or rabbits? We're very brave, aren't we? Twenty-eight of us sticking together, trying to tell ourselves we're noble and right. Not one of us willing to cut and run because we're afraid somebody might think we're yellow. Well, if you feel that way, why did you come? Because I'm weak. My father's strong. And that's hell. Can you understand how that's hell? Now, you didn't start this. It isn't your fault, son. If we get those men and hang them, I'll kill myself. I won't go on living remembering I saw it and was part of it myself. You could still go home. No. No, I can't. And even if I could, it wouldn't matter. I don't count. You're I'm coming, Father. Say, Davies, I just heard that Tetley kid sounding off. What's feeding on him anyway? Oh, lots of things, I guess. You know, he's not much like his father, Darby. He's soft. Besides, he's been sick a lot. Likes to stay by himself and read. Don't sound right bright in the head to me. Well, maybe not. 
But how would you feel if you knew your own father hated you? Mr. Davis? Oh, is that you, Sparks? Yes, sir. Mind if I sit with you a bit while we stop? No, no, not at all, not at all. I was feeling sort of lonesome myself. Mortal cold now, ain't it, sir? Well, it'll be worse later. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Davis, I sure wish we was out of this business. And so do the others, but they're afraid to admit it. It's man taking on himself the Lord's vengeance. You think the Lord knows what's happening up here tonight? Yes, sir. He marks the sparrows fall. Time to move, men. Let's get going. We got to have faith, sir. We got to wait for a sign. I know, Sparks, but how long? How long? It must be them up ahead. You can see their campfire. Yeah, wouldn't they be showing a fire if they were on the run? They would have. They thought they weren't being followed, Davies. Now, men, let's not have any shooting or rough work until they've had a chance to tell their way. The one that got Kincaid is mine. Don't forget that, mate. I won't, finally. He's yours when we're sure. Gerald, you come with me. Mapes. Yes. You take six men and work around from the back. We'll close in simultaneously. Yes, sir. Mr. Davies, would you like a gun? No, thanks. Sparks. No, sir, Major. Thank you just the same. Well, as you choose. Let's go, boys. Good luck. <laughs> camping right along the oxbow. A young fella, an old man, and a Mexican. They were sound asleep when we rode in on them. But it didn't take them long to wake up. Look, what is this? What's the matter? Don't move, young man. Put up your hands. The rest of you, too. You, Max. Uh, no, sorry. That's all right, brother. You will. Gerald, collect their guns. What are you trying to do? What do you want from us? We don't want nothing. This ain't no stick-up, mister. This is a posse. We haven't done anything. Well, that remains to be seen. Gerald. What? Why, you fool, don't get between him and my gun. Look, what's all the mystery? Why don't you tell us what we're being held for? Well, I'd rather you told us. Told you what? What are you talking about? Rustling. Ever hear of it? Rustling? Yeah, and murder. Murder? Ain't we had enough palaver? Let's get it done and go home. That'll do, finally. Who says so? Who picked you to be boss anyway? We got him. I say let's swing him before we all freeze to death. Well, there's a fire over there. If you're cold, warm yourself. Uh, all right, men. Bring the prisoners over to the fire. All right. Sir. I'll question them there. Mr. Davis? Yes, Spark. You think the sheriff's going to get here in time? Uh, that's what I've been thinking about. Suppose he doesn't get here at all. <laughs> You have just heard the first act of 20th Century Fox Studios' great motion picture, The Oxbow Incident, starring Charlie Ruggles, Edward Arnold, and the Screen Guild players. Act two will follow in just a moment, but meanwhile, here's something you ought to know. When the same emergency occurs four years in a row, we've got to accept it as average. For four years in a row, the yearly average for new infantile paralysis cases rose to 30,000, triple what it once was. Average cost for treating patients has gone up, too. Obviously, your National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis needs more money to answer every call for help this year. So give more dimes and dollars to your 1952 March of Dimes. Join today. And now, starring Edward Arnold as Major Tetley and Charlie Ruggles as Mr. Davies, with Eddie Firestone as Gerald, Anthony Barrett as Martin, and Chester Hairstone as Sparks, Hollywood Soundstage presents Act Two of The Oxbow Incident. It was Major Titley who questioned the prisoners, very formal and very quiet. Too formal, too quiet. There was something unhealthy about it, something horrible. Deep down inside, he was enjoying himself. He took the young fellow first, the one who seemed to be the boss. What's your name, young man? Donald Martin. Where are you from? Pike's Hole. That's a lie! Mr. Smith! I get around Pike's Hole a lot. I never seen this fellow before. 
for? I just moved in three days ago, Dave Baker's place. Bought it in Los Angeles last month. I give him $4,000, sight unseen. But my family's there right now, my wife and kids. Look, why don't you take me back and let me prove it? I'm entitled to a trial. You're getting a trial. With 28 of the only kind of judges, murderers, and rustlers get in this country. Do you have any cattle up here with you? I won't ask you again. Yeah. Yeah, I got 50 head. Where'd you get them? I got them from Mr. Kincaid. That's what we figured, son. Look, I didn't steal them, honestly. I, I, I bought and paid cash for them. You got a bill of sale? Mr. Kincaid was out on the range. He said he'd mail the bill of sale. Finally. Yeah? How long have you known Larry Kincaid? Ever since we were kids. Ever known him to sell any cattle without a bill of sale? Never. Hmm. But he did, I tell you. He'll tell you himself. Why don't you go ask him? Quit bluffing. You know that Larry Kincaid can't tell us anything? Why not? He's dead. That wasn't enough for Chetley. He had to have his fun with the other two. The old man and the Mexican. But the old man just kept blubbering. (laughs) I didn't do nothing. I don't want to die. I don't want to die in the dark. And the Mexican (laughs) kept insisting stubbornly. No, 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 sabe, senor. Me no sabe. And still young Martin, stuck by his guns, refused to change his story one bit. I tell you, Kincaid was alive yesterday afternoon. He sold me those cattle to stock my place. Don't you believe me? Why do you have to blame it on me? Who gave you the right? Who sent you up here? The sheriff. Now, that's not true, Major Tetley. The sheriff didn't even know we were coming. No, but I did. That's right, Mapes. Mr. Davies, perhaps I should have said the deputy sheriff. That makes it quite legal, I believe. Now, listen, men. I'm not trying to obstruct justice, but this lad is only asking what he's entitled to, a fair trial. Now, Martin, you say you're innocent. And I, for one, believe you. Makes you the only one, Davies. All right, men, tie them up. No, you you don't mean you're going to... But you you, you, you can't. I've got kids. One of them's just a baby. Look, just give us some time. That's all I want, a little time. You've had too much already. Well, I've got to write a letter. If you're human, you'll give me time for that. Oh, Major Tetley, that's not too much to ask, huh? Hmm? I believe you may have a point there, Mr. Davies. Mapes, what time is it? Five after three. Gentlemen, we don't want to give anyone cause for complaint. With your permission, we wait till daylight. That'll give Reverend Sparks the time to settle his business at leisure. He gave the letter to me, Major Tedley, and asked me to take it to his wife. If you'd only read it, it's such a fine letter. I'm not disputing that, Mr. Davies. But if it's an honest letter, it's none of my business to read it. And if it isn't, I have no interest in it. Won't any of you read it? Any of you? Well, why not? Why not? Is it because you don't want to know the truth? It's a beautiful letter. If you just read it, you'll know he's not the kind of a man who could steal or kill. That kind of argument don't stand up against branded cattle and no bill of sale. Well, I I was just hoping. Gentlemen, it's daybreak. Major Tetley, I'm warning you. If we hang these men and they're innocent, we're due to be hanged ourselves. Well, then I suggest we act as a unit. Now, there can be no question of mistaken reprisals. Mr. Davies... Are you willing to abide by a majority decision? How about the rest of you? Very well. All right, all right. All who agree with Mr. Davies for putting this off and turning it over to the courts, step over here. Mr. Davies, one. And me, sir? Sparks. Uh Uh-huh. That's two. Yeah. Me, too, I guess. Mr. Darby? Count me. I'm with Mr. Davies. Gerald! Anyone else? Four of you, huh? Uh, Mr. Davies, that's hardly a majority. Come on, what are we waiting for? Finally, we'll do this in a legal manner. Tie their hands behind them. Put them up on their horses. That second limb on the oak there, that'll hold them. Smith, you get up there and tie the ropes. Sure will. Finally, 
Hanley, you'll whip one horse out. Mapes will whip the second. All right. And Gerald, you'll whip the third. <laughs> see it now. The terrible, quiet cruelty of the man forcing his son, a boy like Gerald, to be an executioner. But it was fate, I thought, that Gerald should fail him this once again. At the very last moment, the boy turned away, sobbing and choking, until Chetley stepped forward and struck him down with his gun and whipped the third horse out himself. Then as those three figures kicked convulsively in the air, he turned to Farnley very quietly. Finish them, Farnley. Right. Well, that's done with. Now we can go. Hey. What's going on? Hey, it's the sheriff. Yeah. What's up? What's all the shooting for? <laughs> yeah, there they are, sheriff. We got them all right. About who, mate? What are you talking about? Kincaid's murders. We got all three of them. And hung them, too. Yeah. Well, you must be loco. Larry Kincaid ain't dead. Not dead? Well, but but we thought... I just left Kincaid with the doctor, and I got the fellow that shot him, too. Well, but, but Sheriff, them fellows, they, they had Larry's cattle and no bill of sale. Give me your badge, mate. But... Sure, sure. Mr. Davies, I know you well enough to know you didn't have anything to do with this. I'm depending on you to tell me who did. All... But four. Well, God better have mercy on the rest of them, because they ain't going to get any from me. I'll meet you with Judge Tyler in the morning. Uh, gentlemen, under the circumstances, I think we'd better return to our homes. I'm going into my study, Gerald. And I wish to be alone. I want to talk to you first. I have no desire to discuss anything with you. No. But you've got an idea what I want to say. You loved it, didn't you? I saw your face. The face of a depraved and murderous beast. You knew in your heart those men were innocent, but you were cold crazy to see them hang, to make me see it, too. Yeah, go ahead. Go into your study. Go and hide behind your door, Major Tetley. That won't do you any good. Because I know the truth about you now. I'm not the coward in this family. You are. You're the coward. You're the one. Go ahead. Put a bullet in yourself. That doesn't change anything. You're the coward. You. 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 What's the matter? Don't nobody want to buy a drink? I ain't running this saloon for my health, you know. I don't feel like a drink right now. Funny thing. Me either. Would some of you boys like me to tell you why? Oh, lay off, Davis. Because I asked you to read a letter and you wouldn't. You wouldn't even listen to it. But you're going to listen. You're going to listen to it now. I'm going to read it to you. It says, my dear wife, Mr. Davies will tell you what is happening here tonight. He's done everything he can for me. I suppose there are some other good men here, too, only they don't seem to realize what they're doing. They're the ones I feel sorry for. They'll have to go on remembering this all their lives. A man just naturally can't take the law into his own hands and hang people without hurting everybody in the world. Because then he's not just breaking one law, but all laws. Law is a lot more than words you put on a book, or judges, or lawyers, or sheriffs you hire to carry it out. It's sort of like the conscience of the whole world. And when you hit at that, you hit at everybody. Everywhere. Well, there's more, but it's kind of personal, I don't think he'd want me to read it. Besides, I think you've heard enough. Yeah, I... I gotta be going anyhow. 
Yeah, me too. Here they've gone now. The town looks almost deserted again. A blazing sun. One dusty street and nothing moving. Just an old, tired, mongrel dog. It won't be remembered very long. A small thing, not much. You might say, just an incident. Oh, coming for to carry me. have just heard the Hollywood soundstage production of 20th Century Fox Studios' great dramatic hit, The Oxbow Incident, starring Charlie Ruggles as Mr. Davies and Edward Arnold as Major Tetley. And now, back on stage for a final word. Here are the stars of our play tonight, Edward Arnold and Charlie Ruggles. Well, thank you very much. I shouldn't have to tell you how happy we were to do this show tonight. I'm sure you all know that this radio program helps support the Motion Picture Relief Fund. And every actor in Hollywood is proud to share in a great work like that. Right, Eddie? Absolutely, Charlie. And not only actors, producers, writers, directors, everyone in our industry is combining to make this half hour one of the really great spots of the radio week. And, folks, you'll realize just how great when Hugh Douglas tells you about next week's show. In, well, in about ten seconds. Mm -hmm. That gives us just ten seconds to wrap it up, Charlie. Good night, everybody, and many thanks. Yeah, good night. night. Thanks again. Next week, Hollywood Soundstage brings you the dramatic treat of the radio season. Two magnificent performers in a magnificent story. Richard Widmark and Eleanor Parker in a radio adaptation of Metro-Golden-Mayer's unforgettable motion picture, The Postman Always Rings Twice. Next Thursday night at the same time, Eleanor Parker and Richard Widmark in The Postman Always Rings Twice. Don't miss it. The Oxbow Incident was presented tonight through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, whose current release is Decision Before Dawn, starring Richard Basehart and Gary Merrill. Edward Arnold will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox picture, Bells on Their Toes. Also heard in tonight's play were Bill Boucher, Frank Nelson, Ken Christie, Virginia Gray, Norman Field, Herb Vigran, and Will Wright. Hollywood Soundstage was transcribed in the film Capital. Our play was adapted and directed by Harry Cronman. To be sure your giving gets there when you send food or textiles overseas, use CARE. CARE is the non-profit worldwide organization for person-to-person relief. In six years, CARE has delivered 11 million packages overseas. CARE charges only the cost of wholesale buying and bulk shipping. And CARE guarantees delivery. Write for a catalog to your local office of C-A-R-E. CARE. This is Hugh Douglas. And remember, you meet sparkling comedy when you meet Millie Sunday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>